So welcome everyone to uh, one of the webinars that's being offered as part of the Awareness to Action project uh, that is being spearheaded from the uh, Center for Research on Violence uh, Against Women and Children out of the University of Western Ontario and our own local uh, regional chapter, which uh, we work with the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center um, in collaboration with an alliance of other Canadian research centers on gender-based violence. So really want to thank you for joining us for this very exciting uh, webinar that's being offered um, by Dr. Mary Aspinall uh, from St. Thomas University's Criminology Department on coercive control and intimate partner violence. Um, I will uh, give you a small summary of that presentation as well as a bit of a bio of Dr. Aspinall. Um, we like to take a moment to invite everyone just to reflect on the place that they're in, um, and in particular, uh, what traditional or certainly in our case here along the banks of the Wallistic, um unceded territory of the nation's uh, Indigenous peoples. And so we ask you to reflect on what lands you may be situated on as you attend here. This webinar could be anywhere across Turtle Island. And in particular, we want to ask us all to just uh, reflect on the ongoing work that we each want to do to make the promise of truth and reconciliation real in our communities uh, and in our work, in particular, to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across the country. And having that particular reflection inform our discussions in this webinar and beyond. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our webinar speaker, Dr. Mary Aspinall. Uh, I, she is a research fellow with the Mary McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research. And I've had the pleasure of having her as a departmental colleague at St. Thomas University in our Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice for the last two years. Mary joined us shortly after completing her PhD in sociology at the University of New Brunswick, and she has a wealth of experience in family violence research, a bit staggering, um, given her youthfulness, uh, and certainly intimidating to those of us already working in the field. She's uh, served as a researcher for the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative. She was a panel member for the Saskatchewan Domestic Violence Death Review. Uh, there in Saskatchewan, she also worked at a women's shelter. She was a domestic violence caseworker. And more recently, she prepared an expert re witness report for the Mass Casualty Commission of Nova Scotia, um, which is of particular relevance to the work that she's going to share with us today, specifically on Canadian police officers' perceptions and assessments of risk of IPV um, following a survey that she did in collaboration with Dr. Carmen Gill. So we've no doubt heard enough from me for now. So it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Aspinall um, and ask her to share some of her research with us now. Great, thank you very much, Carla. Um, thank you for having me present today. Um, thank you for everyone who is in attendance this afternoon, at least it's afternoon here on the East Coast. I know we might have some attendees from uh, out West or it might still be morning. Um, I won't reintroduce myself, um, but I'm very excited to speak to you all today about some research that I did assist in conducting with Dr. Carmen Gill, as Carla mentioned, um, who is my former PhD supervisor and now um, very close research colleague of mine. What I thought I would do today, rather than spend the full time uh, going through the research study itself, um, I want to start with some general overview and discussion of coercive control. Uh, many of you who are here this afternoon might be very familiar with this concept already, um, but I think it's helpful um, not only in case you are not very well versed in this at the moment, but also it really it really will set a baseline for what was driving our study and our interest in this area and give some background context um, to that as well. I will mention in terms of terminology, um, sometimes I will use things interchangeably like domestic violence or intimate partner violence, perpetrator, abuser. Um, this can depend on how we ended up wording things in our study or research that I'm citing. 
Uh, and I will also mention, I do tend to use the term victim, um, but I am conscious and understanding that there are some that prefer the term survivor, um, but again, for continuity purposes, um, I will tend to, to say victim. Um, so when talking about coercive control, um, both Carmen and I do like to often start out using this image of an iceberg. Because ultimately, coercive control is intimate partner violence. It is not separate from intimate partner violence. It is not merely one component of intimate partner violence. It is intimate partner violence and abuse. And there can be many differences between the things that we do see versus the things that we don't see. And so within these situations, there are often far more things that are hidden, just like an iceberg. What we see above the water is really only a small portion of what's actually creating, um, in many cases, these huge monstrosities. And so when we talk about intimate partner violence and abuse, what we are often seeing above that waterline, so to speak, are those obvious signs, which are largely the physical abuse. So it's the scratches, the bruises, the broken bones. And what is underneath the surface and less obvious are things like the minimizing, the denying, the blaming, the jealousy, the manipulation, the gaslighting, the stalking, sometimes the verbal abuse, that list can go on and on. And this is often where coercive control largely falls. It can be well hidden. And when I say well hidden, I don't mean that victims are consciously hiding the evidence, denying something is happening. I mean that the abuser is using tactics and they're using them in ways and at times where it can be difficult for others to notice. But even if and when others do or victims themselves do notice these things, uh, sometimes they can be dismissed, passed off as romantic gestures even, explained away in other ways. And as Evan Stark defined it, he wrote the seminal book on coercive control back in 2007. These are tactics of behaviors that are designed to hurt, to humiliate, to isolate, to deprive, and to dominate victims. And so we have to consider how our criminal justice system is responding to intimate partner violence. I will come back to this later, but we do generally have a tendency to largely focus on those episodic incident-specific events not behaviors that will transcend over time and space and lead to an accumulation of longer lasting harm. And so one of the questions is often, what does coercive control look like? What are some of the tactics? What kind of behaviors are these perpetrators conducting? This is not an exhaustive list, but some examples of a range that I can share with you. First of all, and very importantly, physical and sexual violence can still be a component of coercive control. Coercive control is not just the considerations of those non-physical tactics of abuse. This is a pattern of violence as opposed to those incident specific events that we may have a tendency to focus on when we're trying to address intimate partner violence. It is also possible that physical violence could occur at some point in the relationship, but not be a constant. Then just the threat then and that credibility of there being potential for future physical violence could be enough to maintain control for the duration of that relationship. It's also important to note that in a number of domestic homicide cases that have occurred, the only event of physical violence that was noted in the relationship is the homicide itself. And so we have to be aware of other types of abuse that could be occurring before it reaches that point. The challenge though, is that it's often these non-physical tactics that we fail to recognize. And so some of these behaviors are exactly what you have here on the slides. Um, there can be emotional abuse, monitoring the victim's daily activities, denying access to household utilities, denying access to transportation, denying access to finances in the relationship. Abusers might also prevent the victim's attendance at work or at school and slowly isolate them from other support networks such as their family and friends. They may destroy or damage property. This could include phones or controlling the use of communication devices. They might restrict someone's access to healthcare and medications. They might coerce the victim into a pregnancy or manipulate the use of birth control. 
They might use the legal system to manipulate the victim, whether that's around immigration status, family court, child custody, and so on. The abuser might also threaten their own suicide to control the victim. And with ongoing developments in technology, abusers might also use social media to harass and threaten to access accounts, to control the use of accounts, track GPS coordinates, install spyware, all of this now meaning that even if victims do leave the relationship, these tactics can still continue. Abusers do not have to be physically present with the victim to elicit control and manipulation, and that relationship does not have to still be intact. This can, and we do see many cases where this does continue after separation and after that relationship has ended. I will also just briefly mention the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative. Um, that was a national study that took place from 2015 to 2020-ish, and I was fortunate to be part of that research team. And in one of the later stages, we interviewed survivors of severe domestic violence and family members of those who had been killed in this context to find out what helpful or unhelpful um, help-seeking strategies had been. And so just to give some reality to some of these tactics, in some of these interviews, we heard stories uh, such as one person lived in a rural area and there was one vehicle that the perpetrator would always take. Uh, for another, if she wanted to get out of the house and go for a walk, it was, oh, don't worry, I'll come with you, I'll keep you company. But it was really to ensure that she was never alone, could not signal for help. Someone else also mentioned that their abusive partner worked away from home for lengthy periods of time but would make sure there were no vehicles to access while he was gone, groceries were limited, and he would take all of the keys, essentially keeping her confined to the home, even though he was nowhere near that location. None of those scenarios included the use of physical violence to maintain that control. And so again, these tactics are not exhaustive, and a perpetrator does not have to use all of these. Maybe one or two are very effective, or maybe more and more are added as time persists and that relationship progresses. So because coercive control is a pattern of behavior over time, this can have um, really deep lasting impacts on a victim. And sometimes we might not necessarily recognize the tactic itself, but we might then see something going on with the victim that could spur a need to start asking some more questions about the relationship. So there can be shifts in day-to-day -day activities. The things the victim used to do, they've now stopped doing. They're not making plans to meet up with friends anymore. They're not participating in the hobbies that they previously used to really enjoy. These may have been eliminated due to the abuser's control and isolation tactics. Therefore, relationships with family and friends might also start to deteriorate. And again, this is usually as a result of the abuser's control and attempts to separate the victim from their support networks. There might be changes in someone's physical appearance or their health. Stress, for example, can cause a lot of problems. Uh, maybe someone is suffering more headaches, getting stomach pains, losing weight. Again, that list can be extensive. The victim might be experiencing fewer opportunities to attend school, to find a job, to make or retain money of their own. And there may be confusion about legal rights. Abusers might convince their victims if they try to leave, they'll lose custody of the children, or they'll be deported and forced to leave the country due to their immigration status. This is not always true, but abusers can be persuasive, and if you are isolated from your support networks, it can be very difficult to get the right information. There can also be significant impacts on someone's mental health as well as their physical health. In various research reports, victims of coercive control have reported experiencing things like depression, anxiety, lower self-esteem, even post-traumatic stress disorder because of the abuse that they have suffered. This is something we do need to be very careful about because abusers have used these kind of resulting impacts to argue that things like parenting ability is compromised because of mental illness. She's unfit to care for herself, she's unfit to care for the children, and it's then used as a weapon against the victim, when in reality she's experiencing these challenges because of the abuser's direct actions. They're the problem. They are the ones initiating these symptoms. 
And so it is possible that mental health considerations could be a piece of evidence that abuse is happening, not that there's something wrong with the victim. And like in situations that do involve physical violence, fear can also be a big part here as well. The ability for abusers to monitor someone means that victims have reported the feeling that they can't ever escape or that they are on an invisible leash because many of the tactics on that previous slide don't actually require the victim and the abuser to be physically near each other. And so some final impacts I'll mention are that victims are conditioned to monitor their own behavior, change the things they do because of what the abuser might say or how they might react. So they may start to second guess their decisions or just defer to their partner. Victims may often blame themselves for what they're going through. I just said this, if I'd just done that, he wouldn't have been upset. And so they may start to try and regulate their own behaviors in anticipation. This can result in a loss of independence and autonomy. A victim might lose the ability to think for themselves and to make their own decisions. And because some of these tactics not necessarily being attributed right away to intimate partner violence, a victim might not even realize that what they're going through is abuse. And so I've had some good feedback from using the analogy of a jigsaw here. Um, I do not take credit for this. I've read about this in other sources. I think it's just a great way to explain it. Um, but putting together an experience of coercive control is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Each piece on its own really does not tell you a lot of information. You don't know what that final picture is going to be just from looking at one single piece. Even as an example on my slide here, there's a few of them there. I have no idea what that final product is actually supposed to look like. Um, but coercive control is like this. Um, so I'll just give you a few examples um, drawing from my previous list of tactics. So let's say denying access to transportation. What this could look like is maybe your partner insists on driving you to and from work and says there's no need for you to have a second vehicle. Maybe that could be one puzzle piece. Asking you to cancel plans with your friend tonight because they want to spend time with you instead. Maybe that is on its own another puzzle piece. Your partner saying they don't like your new haircut, you should change it. That could be another piece. You should quit your job so that we don't have to pay for daycare anymore. I make enough money, I'll take care of the finances. Maybe that's another piece. If we look at those things one by one with no other context, it doesn't look like a lot, right? So is it easy to go to the police, even to tell your friend, your counselor, your lawyer, your family that your partner is being abusive towards you because they don't like your hairstyle? No. And a lot of times we don't see these individual acts as traumatic and abusive actions. But what happens when we start to put everything together, we see all of these different ways in which our partner is criticizing us, trying to stop us from spending quality time with friends, isolating us from work and making our own money, getting jealous about who it is that we're talking to. We start to see this bigger picture and we can see that coercive control is happening when all of these individual pieces are put together. And coercive control might look different for everyone. What's abusive to one person might not be to another. And that's another tricky thing about these situations. Abusers will cater their tactics to things that they know are going to work and be effective for a particular person. And that tactic itself might not be overtly problematic or even criminal. So for someone inflicting abuse, making their partner ask for money might be their way of displaying dominance and control. But for others, maybe there is a mutual consensual agreement that one partner is going to work and the other won't. So there's a budget, you might have to ask to use the debit card, you're checking how much money you can spend, and that might be perfectly fine. Maybe for some couples, they share a vehicle because it makes financial sense, um, or their schedules really only require one vehicle, um, and that's also perfectly fine as well. So instead, when we're looking at coercive control, it's the intent and it's the purpose of the behavior that we have to start recognizing and consider the wider context of that relationship. Otherwise, it can be difficult to identify problematic behaviors. So we could not state that because there's only one vehicle, there must be coercive control happening. 
or only one partner is working, so there must be coercive control. That wouldn't work. Uh, we have to look instead at the why. Is it because this makes financial sense, or is it because one partner is insisting on controlling the whereabouts and the schedule of the other person? And so given the significant impact that these behaviors have, there are some discussions about how to criminalize these experiences. And so based on what I just said in the last slide, you might be thinking, well, if we can't name specific actions or scenarios as being coercive control or violence, how can we define this within the criminal code and make that illegal? So as I also mentioned before, our criminal justice system at the moment largely views and responds to intimate partner violence as episodic incident specific events. I'm being very general here, uh, but police may get a call, they respond, they're looking for evidence of physical violence or property damage, for example, to show that an incident has occurred. How can we report to the police that abuse is happening because your partner is insisting on being the one to drive you places or they're demanding that you change your style or your haircut? We have not generally been looking at the context of the relationship and asking questions about history, the reasons for these decisions, what happens if you don't go along with these demands that are being made and so on. But it is possible to have this paradigm shift. Other countries have implemented coercive control legislation to criminalize these behaviors. England and Wales were among the first in 2015, and then Scotland and Ireland followed in 2019. So the UK has been really leading um, this shift here. But some US states are also considering legislation. Um, there was a bill that was passed in Hawaii in 2020, which was modeled on Scottish legislation, and it's defining coercive control as a pattern of threatening, humiliating, or intimidating actions which seek to take away the individual's liberty or freedom and strip away their sense of self, including bodily integrity and human rights. California has also passed legislation in 2020 allowing coercive control to be invoked in family court hearings as well as criminal trials. They also amended their family code to include coercive control in custody and access decisions as well. And Connecticut also enacted a new law in 2021 that expands their definition of domestic violence to include coercive control, and that can also be applied to all family court proceedings, restraining orders, divorce, and child custody. We're also seeing some states in Australia. Tasmania was actually one of the very first in 2004 to include in their Family Violence Act that a person must not pursue a course of conduct that they know or that they ought to know is likely to have the effect of unreasonably controlling or intimidating or causing mental harm, apprehension or fear in their partner. And we also have some recent reports that coercive control will become a criminal offense in New South Wales as of next month, July 2024, and it's also anticipated in Queensland next year in 2025. So we have other locations that we can look to for examples of how this is being implemented. Canada is considering this. Uh, we are on our third bill. Uh, bill C-247 was the first. This was introduced in October of 2020. It did stall due to a federal election, um, but the same MP reintroduced Bill C-202 in November of 2021. Currently, we now have Bill C-332. This is a private member's bill entitled An Act to Amend the Criminal Code, Controlling or Coercive Conduct. The first reading was held last year, May 18th, 2023. The second reading was completed in February 7th of this year, and the consideration and committee was completed on March 22nd. We also have some updates as of yesterday, which didn't make it onto my slide deck, um, but the report stage in the House of Commons was completed as of yesterday, and the third reading is now underway. So things have moved along, uh, even just this week. Um, back at the consideration phase in March, a number of amendments were made to the initial proposal. I'm not going to reflect on the document in its entirety. Uh, once I stop sharing my screen as we go through questions, I can uh, insert some links to this in the chat if you'd like. Um, but I am going to highlight just a few aspects of the bill uh, in case, especially if anyone's not familiar with it. But it is proposing an offense under Section 264 of our criminal code, which contains criminal harassment. 
The offense would be that everyone commits this offense who engages in a pattern of conduct with intent to cause their intimate partner to believe that their safety is threatened or being reckless as to whether that pattern could cause their intimate partner to believe that their safety is threatened. And it does also contain a list of behaviors that would fall under this pattern of conduct. Uh, coercing the partner into sexual activity is one. Control or monitoring of intimate partner's actions is another. Controlling finances, controlling someone's expression of their gender, um, the perpetrator, the abuser's threats of suicide. Um, there are more. Those are just a few examples. And so it doesn't give specifics in terms of how is that perpetrator monitoring their partner's actions, just that there should be some evidence that this is happening or coercing the partner into sexual activity. It doesn't explicitly give criteria for what that coercion must look like. And so that's how we can work our way around needing those precise definitions. A Justice Canada did hold a series of virtual panels in the fall of last year. This included speaking with academics, practitioners, government officials, survivors to discuss the possible implementation of this kind of legislation. And I will also mention Dr. Gill and I did submit a brief to the House of Commons about coercive control in February 2021. Um, things have shifted a little bit with the legislation proposal since then, um, but that report is also available online if that's of interest to anyone as well. And so this does now lead into our research study that I would like to share some information about. So thank you for bearing with me as I went through all of this background information, um, because it is possible that we may see the criminalization of coercive control at some point here in Canada. Even if it doesn't pass, it does seem to be gaining some traction, but either way, we do continue to see that some victims or even those who are close to victims, are reporting concerns to the police. And so law enforcement are, whether they realize it or not, responding to and will continue to be asked to respond to reports of coercive control. And so as I mentioned, I've been working closely with Dr. Gill for a number of years now. Um, she's in the sociology department at UMB, um, but she was the principal investigator on this particular study, and we received funding from a SHRC partnership development grant to do this. And there were other members of our research team as well, I should mention. It uh, was not just Dr. Gill and myself. Um, but our team recognized that research related to coercive and controlling behaviors in intimate partner violence situations was still in its infancy. I mentioned Evan Stark wrote the book about coercive control in 2007, so this is not a brand new term, but many still did not recognize the patterns of power and control in relationships, especially when those non-physical tactics of abuse were being used. And this included the police especially. So we were curious if, should the criminalization of coercive control be enacted here in Canada in the near future, are police ready for these new laws? And we were also curious how knowledgeable are police officers about intimate partner violence more generally? So you have our two primary research questions, one being are coercive controlling behaviors recognized by frontline police officers when they are responding to intimate partner violence calls? And do police officers have the ability to effectively assess for the presence of coercive controlling behaviors? So to do this, we did collaborate with the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police to send an anonymous online survey to police officers across the country. This participant pool was aimed to include all police officers, so that would include provincial, municipal, indigenous, and federal with the RCMP. I will mention that there were some limitations ultimately to our results in terms of the number of officers that did complete the survey. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into that. If there are questions about that at the end, I'm happy to answer those. And so the content of our survey was primarily a replication of another study that had previously been done by Amanda Robinson and her colleagues in the United Kingdom. They did also give us permission to use their content. Amanda had assessed for similar themes amongst police officers in the UK, and she'd also conducted the same study in the US with police officers there as well. And so we were very curious too if results are comparable between different westernized countries. So the survey contained both open and closed-ended questions and was generally broken down into four main components. 
as we generally would do in research, we ask demographic information, so gender, length of service, location, rank, things like that, to get a general sense of who was responding. We then also randomly assigned a hypothetical scenario for the police to consider. One of the scenarios contained a description of physical violence, the other did not. And then we asked them to respond to various questions about how they would respond. And I'll talk about that some more. We also included questions about police officers' perceptions and understandings of various risk factors in intimate partner violence situations, as well as their experience with formal training uh, for responding to intimate partner violence. So I'm not going to get into all the demographic details, but I will cover um, some of the other findings. So as I said, there was a hypothetical scenario that included details of a call that contained physical violence and others received the same scenario, but the particular details of physical abuse were removed. And the survey was set to randomly assign one of these scenarios to the police officer respondents. We wanted to see if police officers, especially with the non-physical scenario, if they recognize that there are still problems with this situation and see how their responses might differ. So just so you have some idea of what the police were responding to, here is the scenario. I will quickly read through it just in case you have any obstructions on your screen. I know the text is also a little smaller here as well. Um, but John and Emily are arguing loudly and neighbor calls the police. Once the police arrive, Emily says that John is her boyfriend and they recently lived together in the home that she owns. However, three days ago, she kicked him out of the home. According to Emily, John came over unannounced and they began arguing about his repeatedly showing up at her home, which or showing up at her work, sorry, my screen's cutting off here, which had caused her to be fired from her job. They also argued about how his constant unsolicited Facebook and text messages, phone calls and showing up unannounced and unwelcomed at both work and home made her feel scared and uncomfortable. She said she asked him to leave, but he refused. Emily says she tried to leave the house, but John grabbed her arm and flung her onto the couch. Then she said he struck her with the back of his hand. Emily feels her swollen eye and starts crying. John interrupted and said, I was just protecting her from the guys at her workplace. I didn't like the way they looked at her. Emily then showed the officers the messages John had sent her throughout the day, including multiple messages that said he would kill himself if she didn't take him back. Upon entering the kitchen, the officers noticed a phone on the floor. Emily says she had tried to pick up the phone to call 911, but John ripped the phone out of the wall. So this scenario was the same for all officers, with the bolded sentence as that exception. So this was the inclusion of the physical violence event. So for those who were randomly assigned the non-physical scenario, they had exactly the same text here, just with that bolded sentence removed where it says he struck her. What did we find from this? Well, we did continue to see, as we expected, that police officers did tend to focus on physical violence. Now, it was a positive aspect to note that when police, um, or sorry, when the police officers were asked if they saw any abnormal behaviors or red flags, we'll say, in relationship, 98% of them said yes across both of those scenarios. So that was great to see. But when asked if they considered the scenario to be a case of intimate partner violence, pretty much all of the police officers who received the scenario that contained that physical violence sentence said yes and strongly agreed that it was, whereas only 67% of those who received the non-physical scenario thought that that also constituted IPV. So the removal of the physical violence element reduced officers' perspectives that this was uh, this kind of situation. Now, again, there were more than 50% that still thought this was IPV, but ideally, we would have liked to have seen similar considerations as those who got the physical violence scenario, but we didn't. We also asked if they considered the situation to be dangerous. Those who received the physical violence scenario said yes and strongly agreed to this about 90% of the time, whereas only 61% of those who received the non-physical scenario thought that that was dangerous. This is a concern, as research has shown, and we continue to see evidence in domestic homicide files, as I said earlier, that sometimes that only act of physical violence is the killing itself. Yet there are often histories of coercive control and other maybe non-physical tactics of abuse that have been present that led to that point. 
that can also highlight some of our findings as to why they might be considering these kind of responses. Within the survey, we also provided police officers with a list of 36 risk factors for intimate partner violence. Amanda Robinson and her colleagues also did the same in their survey, although their list contained, I believe it was 20 items, whereas ours had a few more. Uh, for the Canadian context, we did um, I'll draw from what Amanda Robinson had included in her survey, but also from information from Canadian death review committees about risk factors that we also consider here. And so that added a few more to our list. So they had this list of 36 factors and initially we asked them to identify which ones do you consider to be very or extremely important and then ultimately asked them to narrow this down to the top five that they believe are the most essential for evaluating risk. Just as a few examples, some of the items that did receive the most votes for being very or extremely important were things like using a weapon, forcible confinement, strangulation, physical assault, an escalation of abuse, threats to kill, and the perpetrator having a criminal history of domestic or sexual violence. Some that were not considered very or extremely important were things like the perpetrator's unemployment, an age disparity between the couple, so one is very much older or very much younger than the other, conflict over child contact, there being a new partner in the victim's life, and the perpetrator witnessing intimate partner violence in their family of origin, just as a few examples for you. So we can see these prioritized ones were still overwhelmingly risk factors that contained serious physical abuse. And this continued, as you can see on the slide here, when asking them to create their top five list. So these top five that got the most votes, so to speak, being the most essential were using or threatening to use a weapon, strangulation and choking, escalation of abuse, making threats to kill, and physical assault that has resulted in injury. What we also found really interesting when we compared our findings with Robinson's is that our Canadian sample of officers and her samples of UK and US officers all gave the exact same top five factors as being the most essential. And so, of course, I'm not saying these items are not important and suggest that something could be high risk. Of course they do. But the reality is that even a combination of seemingly lower level non-physical factors could also indicate a high risk situation. And I will note that there were a handful of officers in our study that did recognize this and commented on that, but they unfortunately were in the minority. But what we also see, which may also help explain this, is that many of these physical injury inducing factors are present in risk assessment tools that police are often trained to use. So again, we weren't too surprised that their focus goes here as being some of the most important. So on that note, again, I'm just highlighting a few things here. We can consider the risk assessments police officers are using. There is some variation between jurisdictions. There are some other options for risk assessment tools, but what we have seen is that those that are most commonly used amongst police in Canada are the ODERA, the SARA, and the BeSafer. The ODERA is an actuarial assessment that eliminates practitioner discretion by including a list of 13 predetermined factors, and it's aiming to assess the risk of recidivism. The SARA and the BeSafer are structured professional judgment tools that provide that practitioner with some guidelines, but do also allow a bit of flexibility in decision making and overall assessment of risk. These tools have been validated, but there is a concern that there's a focus on physical violence here. For example, some common factors that are found in all three of these assessments are prior intimate partner violence, violence towards non-intimate partners, the use of or access to weapons, and threats to kill the victim and or any children. There is little to no consideration about coercive controlling behaviors. So aligned with some limited legislation that allow police to arrest, such assessments that they're also trained to use might limit their understanding of abuse and the need to respond. So this is not to suggest that police are inherently dismissive of intimate partner violence, but they are trained through the legislation that we have and the tools that they have to assess risk to look still for these episodic incident specific events, not necessarily to inquire about the context of the relationship. <laughs> 
But again, there is some possibility of including some of these considerations, um, like we've seen with efforts to criminalize coercive control. And once again, we look to the UK here. So there they do have the domestic abuse, stalking, and honor-based violence, risk identification, assessment, and management. Thankfully, otherwise just known as the DASH, much easier to say, which was rolled out across all police services in March of 2009. This addresses the need to ask more questions about the context of the relationship, and it states that half of the questions do focus on coercive control as well as stalking and honor-based violence. It has 27 items, which are generally longer than some of the assessment tools that we do frequently see here. And it's inquiring about themes like isolation, control of the victim's activities, jealousy, threats, um, constant texting or stalking, sexual abuse and humiliation, as well as threats of suicide. And as police officers are inquiring about each risk factor and whether it is present or not, they're also encouraged to include any other relevant remarks in a blank text box beside each question about where they got that information from. There are also three questions at the end prompting written responses from the police about any other information that they think is relevant, the abuser's occupation or interest and in whether this could lead to access to weapons and what the victim's priorities are in addressing their own safety. Now this has since been reviewed and now they're at the current DARA, the Domestic Abuse Risk Assessment. This is now an updated and preferred tool for frontline police, but specialist officers and others who are conducting a secondary assessment are still using the DASH. So these are both in circulation. But one big shift in the DARA is the scoring of the questions. Instead of a yes or no response, this tool inquires how often a behavior occurs with options of it never occurs, occasionally, often, or all the time. So just to give you a few examples, some of the questions are how often does your partner call you names, humiliate you, or degrade you? How often does the, your partner make you account for where you've been or monitor your phone, email, or social media to check up on you? So those are just a few examples, but again, highlighting, I think that it's possible to move away from that yes, no, is this present or not present kind of assessment and consider that wider context. So back to our survey findings, we also inquired about police officers training and education. From our total sample, we discovered that 72% of the officers did identify that they had received some kind of formal training on intimate partner violence, but only about half of them said that this had happened within the last year. We also inquired if they considered whether or not further training would be beneficial for them, but only about 40% thought that it would be. Um, that's a bit of a concern, um, considering some of the responses we had on the survey, but also recognizing that they just might not know what they don't know. Uh, we also inquired about their knowledge of the bill to criminalize coercive control. At the time of the survey development, this was the initial Bill C-247, only 26% of officers had heard about this. We do recognize this may be more visible now. There's been a lot more conversation about it, but it was clear that this legislation proposal was largely unheard of by the officers that responded to our survey. We did describe what it was. Um, we anticipated this a little bit and put it in the survey as to what this bill is actually describing. Um, once they had heard about it, 72% considered that they thought it would benefit police when responding to intimate partner violence. And I will just quickly mention, before we did the survey, we did host some regional virtual workshops with some police officers across the country as well. Some may have responded to the survey, some may have not. It was anonymous. Um, we don't know. But we did hear discussions here that police do sometimes feel that their hands are tied with what they can and can't do when responding to some, some intimate partner violence calls anyway, um, with the limitations that there are in the criminal code and other evidentiary requirements. So it is possible that some are considering that coercive control legislation would allow further responsibility um, when they're getting these calls for service. So I'm mindful of the time here, this is my last slide, um, but we watch the UK very closely. They are a leading example of the development of new and updated risk assessment tools and legislation that are trying to recognize, address, and combat coercive control. And what we learned from them is that it is very important to have this multi-sector response. 
Changing the legislation is one thing, but it's not going to fix the problem if everyone else is not educated and on board. So for police officers that don't yet have training on coercive control, they do need it, but it doesn't stop there. Other judicial staff must be knowledgeable, social services, victim services, any others who might be involved in these cases so that they're not falling through the cracks or being dismissed. And this also applies to the general public as well. I think there needs to be more general understanding and awareness of coercive control. But we also do have to recognize our vulnerable and our marginalized populations. Training should include intersectional perspectives and recognition of the experiences and history of Indigenous, persons of color, and other minority groups who are under-resourced and over-policed to ensure that they're not disproportionately impacted by new policies or new legislation should that happen. What we've also seen from some UK research is that an increase in training about the legislation and coercive control has helped to increase arrest and prosecution rates for this offence, which were admittedly on the low end when it was first uh, introduced. Uh, the UK Office for National Statistics have recorded a 49% increase in the number of coercive and controlling behaviour offences in England and Wales uh, between March 2019 and 2020. Of course, not all arrests end up in prosecution and conviction, but we are seeing some increases in prosecution um, as the years go on as well. So it is climbing. So we would conclude that we do need more education and training on coercive control, but more ways to identify it and updated risk assessment tools being just one way of doing that. And so there is still some work underway regarding this. Um, Dr. Gill previously led the development of the National Framework for Collaborative Police Action on Intimate Partner Violence, and an updated framework on coercive control and risk assessment is in the works, which will ideally improve law enforcement response there as well. Um, we also have a website, the Canadian Centre for Policing Intimate Partner Violence. Um, we do have resources live on the website so far. So various articles, reports, infographics, information on our partners and our collaborators across Canada as well. Um, we're hopeful to continue this work to formally establish this centre to create a centralised dialogue between police, researchers, community partners, government and survivors in order to more effectively respond. And I'm very happy to report that some of the findings of the research I just shared with you are published in the journal Policing and Society. Um, this particular article does focus on the risk factor and police assessment piece, um, but we are working on some others uh, to publish in the near future as well. So I will conclude there. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. If you do have questions um, later or something comes to you tonight, tomorrow, next week, um, please feel free to email me, follow up at any time. Um, I believe the uh, evaluation link will be in the chat somewhere anytime now. <laughs> um, but I'll pass this back over to Carla and we'll get started with some questions if there are any. Thank you so much.